Welcome to Sheep Stuff You Should Know. I'm Dan Macon up in Auburn, Flying Mule Sheep Company and UC Cooperative Extension. And I'm Ryan Mahoney, uh, Rio Vista, California. I work with uh, AV Livestock. Well, it's another week and we're uh, we're halfway through May already. So what's going yeah, on in Rio Vista? That was shearing. It was good. It was good. It was, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, we're kind of in that mid medium size where we're too small for a crew, but too big for somebody that can't shear quickly. And uh, guy that does our shearing does a great job. We were, um, we were actually putting wool in the barn by about 4.30 Saturday afternoon. So it was nice. a good feeling to get that, get that done and get the sheep back out on feed. And so it was a good day. What's the, what's the plan for the wool this year? Actually, I've been talking with Fiber Shed, and they are exploring some markets for coarse wool. I'm not sure exactly what they're doing, um, but they're going to take all of our coarse wool this year. I just got to get it down to, to Marin County, and uh, they're going to do some experimentation with it. So no matter what we get for it, it's more than we got for our 2019 wool, and, and we'll be happy. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be good. It'll be good. God, ain't that the truth? What's going on down there? Oh, no, same as always. That we're running, running like crazy. We're weaning calves, and uh, and then we got a little unseasonal rain. We we'll usually we get a shower in May, but we got got a little rain shower here last night, which was nice. Get the dust down. It's not going to help the yeah. feed any, and make yeah. all the hay farmers angry. But uh, yeah, yeah, all in all, it's been a good week. Real busy, but real good. Always good and rewarding. It's that time of year. I think there's no shortage of things to do in May, at least here. No, gosh, no. Busy. Yeah. So I well, think we'll your topic this week. What What are we going to talk about this? Yeah. Week? So I decided I, after a long, long, uh, long retreat and meditation, I decided <laughs> that we are going to podcast on the ponderings, the ponderings of the particulars of the perfect pastures. So that pleases me perfectly yeah <laughs> so anyway but i we have that that it came up there in the last one and and uh, in the last little meeting and and i thought that that would be a really interesting topic for me i'm uh, my weakest subject by far is um is pasture and soil science and that side of the business um like we I told you before, I'm a religious studies major that's learning to be a sheep herder. So, um, <laughs> you know, when it comes to what motivates sheep to do things, I'm probably, I can come up with something. But uh, when it comes to the pastures and things, I, I'm i very good at throwing a lot of bad words around that don't make sense. So, <laughs> um, so I'd, I'd like to start with pastures. And um, could you, I... The first question I have for you, could you give a little bit of background of, of your experience and history in the soil sciences and pasture in general? Sure, sure. And I'll, I'll kind of differentiate a little bit, um, at least in our operation. And I think it'd be interesting to, to think about this with yours too. Um, we look at, at kind of a annual forage calendar that includes what I call pasture, irrigated pasture. Um, as well as rangeland. So my kind of sheep herder definition of rangeland is anything that's too steep, too hot, too cold, too dry, too something to support a cultivated crop. And yet it does grow grass or, or brush or broadleaf plants that we can harvest with livestock. And so we split our year into kind of when we're grazing on rangeland versus when we're grazing on irrigated pasture. Um, obviously, pasture is an improved system. We, we plant our irrigated pasture with perennial um, pasture plants, grasses and clovers primarily. And then we, we provide the, the precipitation in the form of irrigation to keep that growing um, in the spring, summer, and into early fall. So one of the the things that that we kind of look at in terms of where we we want to spend our resources and our effort is where we can have the biggest bang for our buck so in terms of looking at soil fertility and, and soil health it matters across all of those landscapes 
but because we've invested in seed and sometimes in fertilizer on the irrigated pasture side, we, we kind of give the soil health a, a closer look in that part of our system than we necessarily do on the rangeland side. And I think the other component for us up here is just looking at um, kind of the productivity of those two systems. And I think you may call rangeland native ground or your hill ground kind of the, the same type of, of thing. Um, but our irrigated pasture will support um, about six ewes per acre for a six month irrigation season. One eight, those same six ewes on our range ground are gonna require eight to 10 acres for a six month season. So it's almost exponentially more productive on that irrigated pasture than it is on our range land. And so it, you know, we about half, roughly half of the grass we harvest is on pasture versus rangeland. But in terms of the total acreage, we're probably more like 75% rangeland and 25% irrigated pasture to make up that forage base. What what kind of walk me through your forage base a little bit, Ryan? What where do the, the cattle and the sheep go as you go through the year? What does that look like? Um, so for us, we um uh, I separate the same very similarly to how you described kind of we call it native range or um, dry ground versus our irrigated ground and the difference being that the um, irrigated ground we can water we have access to water any kind of cultivated crop on whereas the native range it's what the rainfall gives us is what we get right. so um, and there is there is some dry wheat farming and dry farming that goes on in that native range Mm -hmm. um, we don't do any of that ourselves. We will lease it out to a farmer to do if we're needing to turn the ground over for a reason. But um, of course, in those in the native range, we have a substantial. We have we have very clear seasons. So mm -hmm. there's a growing season and a harvest season, and then a dry season. And so, or you know, the dead ground plant it would be planting for the following year, I guess. But um, and so with that, you have a, a real big swing in the, in the nutritional value of the feed as you go through the year. Yep. Um, and it follows the growing curve uh, that you could learn. And uh, you could probably talk a lot more about that. Like I said, I don't want to get into yep. too many, too much of the science because I'll screw it up. <laughs> but, um, and then on our irrigated pasture, we have um, planted clover. Um, and then in our area, we have a lot of natural ryegrass that grows. Mm -hmm. So we end up with a ryegrass clover mix for the pasture base. And then um, we graze it. The stocking density is substantially higher than uh, the um, hill ground. Uh, we tend to not run our mother livestock. So our cows are used, don't run on our irrigated pasture very often. And mm -hmm. it's because of the cost of production on that. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to run our, uh, our lambs to finish or purchased in lambs or purchased in feeder cattle on that on that system um, we will in cases of drought we will run some yeah. other livestock on there but it's it's uh yeah it's one of those risk management tools the opposite way of what we talked last week yeah absolutely and i think that's i think one of the common features between both of our operations is that we're trying to match the nutritional demand of a particular class of livestock with the nutritional availability we've got in our our range of forages so we kind of do the same thing right now all of our we're running pairs um, so ewes and lambs on irrigated pasture mostly because we want to keep that pasture in a good vegetative growing state so we want to go through right now when it's growing very rapidly and top it off so that it doesn't get rank on us. But as soon as we wean the lambs, those ewes are going back out on our rangeland pastures that are lower nutrition, um, more extensive, that'll meet their demands and we'll save that irrigated pasture then for the lambs through the summertime. So very similar kind of considerations, I think. So on, on your pastures, do you uh, are you the first but do you take soil samples and forage samples and then if you do uh, you're nodding so i'm assuming you do and if you do what are kind of the 
key things you're looking for when you're taking those samples and try to relate that back a little bit to kind of some of the building blocks to quality pasture. Yeah, there's a couple of things. We, we probably don't do it as extensively as we should. Um, most of our soil sampling we've done on irrigated pasture, just because we've got a greater investment there in terms of infrastructure and, and management. But in terms of the soil health parameters, we're looking at a couple of things. Um, I definitely wanna know the, the key nutrients, the macronutrients that are available in the soil. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium primarily. Um, but we're also looking really um, a lot more carefully now at soil carbon or at organic matter. Um, and if we can boost the organic matter in those soils, we can increase the water holding capacity when we irrigate. So, you know, if we've got a, a finite amount of water that we can apply to our pastures, and in our system, our irrigation water comes from an irrigation district. We, we still buy it here in the foothills by the miner's inch, just as if we were still gold miners, because um, that's where the system was developed. But we get a set amount of water. If we have more organic matter in the soil, which we can do through our grazing management and, and through some other management techniques, we keep that water available for our plants longer than if we have less organic matter. So that, that to me, you know, it's, it's important to understand nutrients and, and kind of those um, chemical components of the soil, but I'm really focused on organic matter in terms of our soil health and that will help hold water longer. Um, if we've got, you know, we're, we're, all of us, I think, focus on the, the portion of the plant that's above the soil, but there's just as much biomass in that plant underneath the soil in a healthy system. And so we also focus on kind of that root health and, and the relationships between roots and, and other organic matter in the soil. Um, and as far as forage testing, We've done a little bit of that, um, more to satisfy my curiosity and how that changes over the course of the season and um, how different plants in particular um, may be contributing to the nutritional value of our, of our pasture or our rangeland. And so we're looking primarily at um, energy and protein in our forages. So protein is important in terms of the the rumen microbes in the sheep or the cattle um, being able to digest the cellulose that, that you and I can't digest very effectively in our systems. So those rumen microbes are able to ferment um, the, the cellulose that they intake through grazing plants and turn it into essential fatty acids and to energy that then feed the animal. We look at protein um, at a variety of stages through the year. And I also am really fascinated by the idea that, that there are some plants that we think may be undesirable um, that can be pretty important nutrient sources if our animals understand how to utilize them. So a case in point, we um, being total rangeland geeks, took a forage sample of a stand of almost pure yellow star thistle several summers ago. So a highly invasive plant that nobody wants in their systems, right? We took that, those samples in late June and July when the rest of our forage on our rangeland is totally dry. And it came back at, at seven to 9% protein, which is a high enough protein level to maintain a U on. And at that point, our U's were, were almost exclusively eating yellow star thistle because that's the plant that had the most nutrition in that system at that time. So it was kind of an interesting way to, to say, the sheep were already telling us that, that, that that's what they needed, but now we have some of the data to back that up and, and to understand why they were doing it. Well, do you do well, any we, forage testing? Uh, yes, we do a little bit. Um, we do some soil testing and we do um, forage samples. We're, right now we're more focused on forage samples because of um, some grass tetany issues that we're prone to out in our yeah. hills with the way and we apply we apply biosolids to a lot of our 
native ground. And um, so paying attention to the organic side of things, the organic matter, but then also paying attention to the NPK. Yeah. And then the Ford samples have come in to try to um, identify plant species that will help mitigate the high nitrogen of the material. So um, we're, we're looking at that and been developing that over the last one or two years um, with minimal success. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I think that's kind of a new frontier for us in terms of livestock nutrition and, and grazing management. Um, getting a better handle on some of those macro and micronutrients for the livestock that may be related to what the plants are taking up from the soil. Um, just kind of a, a side note on that, one of the issues that we are cognizant of here in the foothills is we graze a lot of old orchard ground. Um, there was a lot of stone fruit grown here in the foothills in the um, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And all of that stone fruit was sprayed with the copper-based dormant spray, which stays in the soil. And so our concern with the sheep is if we've got copper in our soil, how much uptake are we getting in the forage out of that residual copper? And then how much copper are we getting in the sheep um, and causing some potential toxicity issues for the sheep? So there's, I think there's some relationships there um, in terms of the, the soil chemistry the forage composition and then what what the nutritional value to our animals might be. Do you value forage testing or soils testing more? Oh, good question. I think they both have their place. I think they are related, but they tell us a little bit different um, information. So I think forage testing has some value in terms of understanding kind of the seasonal fluctuations and in matching our micronutrient program to the forage. I think that's kind of the next level we want to take is to understand where we're short on micronutrients or maybe where we have access and develop a mineral program that complements our forage and that that's going to change kind of through the season to some extent. Um, part of that's related to soil, but I think, I think in terms of the, the soil testing, um, really beginning to understand that, that soil organic matter, um, relationship with the quality of our forage and the ability of the, of us to get the biggest bang for our buck in terms of both precipitation and irrigation, um, is important. So I think they both have their places. I wouldn't necessarily say one is more important than the other. Do you have any, uh, in your extension work or in your own place, do you have any kind of common problems and easy solutions that, you know, low hanging fruit that, you know, the <laughs> average Joe that hasn't done anything like that they can look at and, and uh, do some simple, easy fixes to improve their productivity without a lot of extra effort. And don't just say nitrogen, that's not fair. <laughs> You know, I think that's, that's the easy answer that most people expect. I think, personally, that if we can get the grazing management right, some of those other issues will take care of themselves. I think we can, we can throw a lot of external inputs at a system like nitrogen or um, other soil amendments or clipping our irrigated pastures if they get too rank or things like that, that really mask the need to, to manage our grazing effectively. And so for me, I think, I think um, focusing on grazing management, on matching the animal's nutritional needs on a particular day with what we're able to grow on our rangeland or on our pastures, understanding how plants grow and respond to grazing, um, is kind of the first step. And then from there, I think, at least from my perspective, we can kind of tweak the system in terms of the inputs. Um, but if we're not managing the grazing effectively, the harvest process, um, we might as well just throw dollar bills out on the pasture and see if that builds organic matter. 
That does help sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Depends what? on the value of the dollar, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exchange rates, right? <laughs> uh, what? what uh, how do you go about determining kind of the proper rotation or, or you know, or and, and you can include multi-species, singular species, kind of some of those things in there. How do you kind of measure whether you're hitting that efficiency within your system? You know, one of the, I'm going to sh share a slide here real quick. Um, one of the things that we, um, we look at is how plants grow. And so all plants kind of go through these three phases of growth. So that phase one there, um, where the S curve is, is kind of um, sloping up, um, that's the point where a plant has either just been grazed or has just germinated, and it doesn't have enough leaf area yet to generate the energy for growth. So it's drawing on carbohydrates from the root system or from the seed in order to generate growth so it can build its solar panels. Phase two, we start having enough leaf area that that, that plant is really optimizing photosynthesis. It's got lots of leaf area, it's capturing solar, sun, solar um, radiation and, and growing very rapidly. And then phase three, um, even with a perennial plant, if we reach that reproductive phase for the plant, um, it's starting to decline in quality. Um, it's, it goes through a process called lignification where it's, it's um, creating more rigid cell walls, maybe to hold up a, a seed head, for example, with grass. Um, and at that point, we've lost some palatability and we've lost some nutritional value. So if you think about your pastures right now, um, you know, if we see if I can use my pointer here, if we're grazing, if we're turning any kind of livestock in kind of at the top of this phase two on our pastures and they're taking material off of that plant and we're grazing it kind of down to the, the top end of this phase one period. Um, we want to wait until those plants have regrown to this phase before we graze them again, right? Because we're still leaving leaf area down here so that they can grow rapidly. We're not having to draw a lot of energy from the root system, but we want them to grow back before we graze them again. So this period, this bottom part of the graph here represents days. We look at that we, we try to match our rest period with the growth rate of the plant. So on our irrigated pasture right now, if I, if I go through, we've got um, pastures that have a fair bit of orchard grass and white clover in them. Right now, May 13th, if I went in and grazed those to the level, you know, maybe a four to six inch height, they'd regrow to the point where we could graze them again probably in 25 days because we're still kind of cool enough that they're going to, those cool season plants are going to grow rapidly. Um, and we've got long enough daylight hours and good soil temperatures, so they're going to grow really fast. Here in the foothills, if I were to, to harvest those plants in, on the 1st of August when it's really hot, they're not going to grow as rapidly. So I'm going to have to adjust my rotation or my rest period to accommodate a slower growth um, pattern in the middle of the summer versus here in the springtime. So we might, we might have a 35 to 40 day rotation in August on the same pasture where we've got a 25 day rotation in May. Does that make can sense? You, yeah, absolutely. Can you, can you um, accomplish the rest days by depopulating the livestock? So going less animals per acre during the slower growth time of year? So we, can, we, we try to maintain the stocking rate to some extent. Um, but yeah, we can, we can adjust it by, by removing some animals. So for example, one of the ways that we do it here, right now we've got, um, just looked at this inventory, we've got 92 mature sheep, which includes replacements and lactating females, and 112 lambs on irrigated pasture. 
and they're running together. So those ewes are consuming more grass than they would if they were dry because they're still lactating. Plus the lambs are big enough, they're eating grass. What we will do in June is wean those lambs and most of them will go away and the ewes will go to dry feed. And so we have fewer head that we make that rotation with on the same pasture. And so we, we don't move as quickly once we've got fewer animals. And that's, that's how we accomplish that rest in the midst of the, the summertime. Um, so for, for our operation, and we, we are, we're on a 21 day rotation, basically. We're seven days of feed, 14 days of rest. Mm -hmm. And we keep the same rotation days, rest days, um, throughout the entire year with the exception of winter, the, the, the mm -hmm. whole irrigation season. And we just, we depopulate the pastures as the growing curve slows down. Okay. And I'm curious, according to the, the what you presented there, it sounds like um, we would actually see better gains if we extended the rotation in the summer rather than the way we're doing it now. Probably, probably would, and there's there's definitely a variety of factors to balance there, right? What do you, what do, you do if well, you have labor, labor efficiency is the one reason we do it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think the other thing to think about, um, you know, overgrazing is a term that gets thrown around a lot, and most of us probably don't really think about what it means in terms of, of the impacts to a particular plant. But overgrazing is really not a factor of the number of animals. Um, if you come look at the pasture where I've got a horse, it's one horse and it's severely overgrazed. And what that tells us is that overgrazing is a function of time rather than animal numbers. And it can really happen one of two ways. So it can happen if, if, our, if we're leaving animals in a pasture past that point where they've grazed down to the bottom of that phase two, that means maybe that plant that they ate on day one has started to put some more leaf out and the animal comes along and eats it again. So we're getting a second bite of a plant before it's recovered from the first bite, essentially is what we're saying there. The other way that we can overgraze, which is, is part of the challenge in, man, in adjusting that rest period is that we bring animals back too soon. And that 14 day rest might work really well in late April or, or May, but in August, when growth is slowed, even if it's fewer animals, if we're coming back too soon, we can impact those desirable plants that the animals prefer to graze on. So that's, that's kind of where we can actually improve the, the nutritional quality and the quantity if we're able to, to adjust our rest periods based on the plant rather than on the calendar, for example. Does the, does the moisture content of the soil affect your rotation at all? Um, yeah, it can. So I, you know, one of the, with irrigation, um, we're trying to maintain between probably 50 to 80% soil moisture to maintain plant growth. If we drop much below that 25 to 50% soil moisture range, we're gonna really impact plant growth. They're not gonna recover as quickly. Um, and so we think about irrigation in terms of both our set and our rotation. Set is how long the water is on a particular place and the rotation is how frequently you come back to that particular place. Um, and I think most pasture irrigation is, is kind of similar in that regard. We try not to, to graze on pastures that are actively being irrigated because with those saturated soils, we can cause some compaction. Um, but we also try to make sure that our grazing doesn't interfere with our ability to get water on a pasture, you know, because if we're not irrigating, we're not gonna get the plant growth or recovery as well. Um, and there's some really, you know, you can use some, some pretty high tech moisture sensors in your pastures to figure out where you are in soil moisture wise. Um, but you can also just dig a hole and 
and see by feel where that is. Can you hear the radio behind me now? No. It just came on automatic. Good. I don't know yeah, why. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I'm, 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 in, I'm, in, I'm engaged. I'm not listening to anything else. This is great. <laughs> Good. Uh, Good. I don't know that I answered your question on moisture. Does that make sense, Ryan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for, so for us, it's a cardinal sin to run the life, run the water under the livestock. That does, yeah. to us, that does more damage than anything else that we do. Uh, that we could do. It, it, I've seen more pastures, and the problem is, is if you overgraze a pasture, and um, you know that pasture is hurt, you can always move livestock off, give it the rest days, and it comes back. Yeah. But if you water under livestock, and they they'll destroy the borders and the checks, and we're all flood yep. irrigation. Yep. And that means you need to re-level the field, which costs you three grand an acre. So yep. <laughs> that yep. way, yep. the, there's, there's all other, all kinds of other reasons not to do that too. You know, you got, you got moist soil and, and warm temperatures and sheep yeah. that are predisposed to foot rot. You're going to be treating some feet. Absolutely. Yeah. I, there's a lot of reasons. Yeah. But yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely creates a mis, an expensive mistake if you end up Yep. running water under especially cattle sheep you can cheat a little bit but with cattle right. you right. can go and if you see guys that water under their livestock the production of the pastures is a tenth of what you can get if you're rotating it properly well and i i think this is probably a topic for another session but i think from a regulation standpoint in terms of water quality what makes sense for us as ranchers in terms of animal health and pasture health also coincidentally protects water quality and so mm -hmm. there's there's benefits to doing all of this um this management that we're talking about so uh you a fan of multi-species grazing yes yes i wish i had more capacity to do it myself but absolutely what, and I know what are the reasons well i would ask you um and i'll tell you my reasons but i want to hear what your reasons are too i think one of the Four, two, two big reasons for me is that different species have different forage um, preferences. And so if we've got a real diverse pasture system, we can take advantage of that diversity with a diversity of grazing animals and harvest techniques. You know, if you look how cows versus sheep graze, just in terms of their physiological structure, um, we're going to impact plants different and that diversity of impact I think is really beneficial. I think the other element gets to some of the animal health questions and I'd be interested in what your experience has been. Cattle are a dead, hit, dead end host for sheep parasites and sheep are a dead end host for cattle parasites. And so if we've got multiple species we may have the ability to manage our internal parasites a little differently than if we were just running a single species. But what, what, why do you guys, how, how do you feel about it in terms of the pasture health? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, I mean, number one is the, um, you harvest more pounds of feed per acre. You're able to convert more of the growth into, into, into uh, realized sellable gains. And uh, which results in better uh, field health. You end up with a better uh, diversity of species within your pastures themselves. When you run only cattle, on especially on our native ground, we run only cattle year over year over year. You'll you'll feed out all of our broadleaves, and you'll end up with a pretty heavy stand of um, of ryegrasses or turns it turns into medusa usually. Yeah. But um, yeah. whereas if you keep the sheep and cattle together blended, you'll maintain the diversity. If you run only sheep, you will actually improve the diversity as far as the broadleaves go you'll get more fur clovers and things but so so we're a big fan of that um, for that reason um, there is the science behind the parasite protection and um, i think that's true in a textbook and it's probably <laughs> true on a ranch but because we're in the delta and it never freezes and right. it never gets too smoking hot that the parasites absolutely love where where we're at and and uh, we definitely have a heavy load but um, we are able to control them throughout the entire year on our on our livestock and i do think the multi-species grazing plays into that um, 
do you just out of curiosity do you have do you see any benefit in terms of predator pressure when you've got cattle and sheep running together yeah cows cows definitely help for us our cows will chase the coyotes off um, mm -hmm. quite a bit mm -hmm. it's uh there but they still get in there but yeah the cattle yeah. do help you said something i want to come back to about um that may be true in the textbook and i i think that's another important factor in terms of managing grazing so i have not noticed my sheep cracking any range textbook ever um, they've never read what sheep are supposed to eat and so i think um you know those kinds of observations when we're out working with our livestock really help inform our understanding of pasture management and range management too if you read some of the textbooks sheep aren't supposed to eat himalayan blackberries or coyote brush right our sheep eat himalayan blackberries and coyote brush before they go eat irrigated pasture plants because they've developed a, a preference for those things and i think um we can manage grazing behavior in terms of exposing our animals to a variety of forages um, that that makes more efficient use of the pastures and the rangelands we've got available to us do you do you do you notice um when you've have you ever tracked weight gains where you've got multi-species versus single species in terms of steers or feeder lambs no uh multi-species grazing has been occurring on our ranch since 1878 <laughs> yeah, so we haven't really gone away from it. it it's a proven system and it it works well and and um when we've taken over ground that say has only had cattle or only had sheep and we introduce the multi-species into it we see we see a increased production of the place so um yeah i think I certainly anecdotally it definitely works um, yeah. as yeah. far as yeah. measurable studies um, we don't have any because we haven't done any so I you uh, know there's been I don't know that there's been any done in California but there has been some research done other places that that puts a number to what you're observing over a lifetime of doing it I think I think that's a really interesting thing to look at further yeah I think it's a it's a, I, I think it's, I, it amazes me how few cattle ranches don't have sheep. And I understand why they got out of it back in the day. But um, in today's economy, you're able to run, I don't know what the numbers are, it depends on who you talk to. But if you have 100 cows, I think you can run 100 sheep or something like that and not see a difference in your feed. And yep. so yep. It, it's extra work. But um, you can increase your uh, overhead revenue your general revenue and maintain the same overhead which is a net net positive so even if it is only 100 sheep it sure makes sense for me to do it <laughs> absolutely absolutely uh, and and i think part of that you know we we don't do it partly because we're operating on on ground that doesn't have any infrastructure um, and for which we don't have long-term commitments. But I think if we did have some longer-term commitments, there'd be some real value in, in adding cattle to our system with the sheep. Have you come across any systems where they add chickens? Yeah, there's a few folks here that are, are um, doing pastured poultry as part of a larger system. Um, and I think, I think there's some, probably some value to it. Um, We've tried meat birds on a small scale here, and I've decided no, don't want to cast any aspersions on anybody that raises poultry, but I'm definitely a sheep guy. Um, and, and poultry was much more labor intensive in our system than, than sheep or cattle were. But I think if, if you can find a way to make it fit from a labor standpoint, there's some real value in adding poultry to that system. Poultry are a little different in that they're a single stomach animal, and so you do have to provide some external feed. But I think if you look at that feed as a way to import fertility for your pasture ground, then it, it starts to make some sense. I like that they eat grubs and larvae, which helps, you know, with the parasite issue. Yep, yep. But 
Uh, can you talk just a minute about that difference? We've, we've alluded to the difference between ruminants and single stomach or gastrointestinal systems. And uh, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on that and um, just the, the nutritional differences because of the physical makeup of those two animals? Uh, yeah, so, so ruminant animals, cattle, sheep, goats, um, there's wild ruminants as well, deer, um, come to mind in, in our part of the world are what we call foregut digesters. Whereas single um, stomached animals, humans, chickens, por pigs, are hindgut digesters. And that means most of the digestion in the, our system happens in the small intestine and then in the large intestine. With the ruminant animal, we've got these huge fermentation vats that um, the feed that those animals consume move through for bacteria to extract, extract nutrients um, from those feed resources. And with that fermentation, ruminant animals are able to, and in fact need fiber in their diet to be able um, to extract and, and manufacture essential amino acids, fatty acids. Um, they can extract energy from those, from those fiber sources as well. Because of that, um, we talked a little bit about kind of the maintenance um, protein requirement for a cow or for a sheep, somewhere in that seven to eight percent of the diet range. Um, we can manage other forage resources that are maybe lower in protein by feeding the microbes in the rumen. And so there's a variety of ways that we can get protein to those microbes. Um, do you guys use protein tubs on dry feed in the summertime? And we use them, we use them targetedly for certain reasons. We try to stay away from them as much as possible. And if we need to supplement protein, we supplement with alfalfa. Okay. Alfalfa. I, we have found that the, that the protein tubs for our sheep are, um, are much like crack. Yeah, that's why we don't feed them. <laughs> yeah, we've started using a, a loose protein supplement that's salt limited, so they they can't eat more of it than they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. um, but but we use that for strategic reasons too, if we're trying to manage um, fuel load, for example, in July or August on dry feed, we'll put protein out there, and then we we increase the the consumption of that dry feed. Yeah, we whereas. We Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say we tend to feed our protein tubs not to supplement protein, but to be a carrier for something else. So, either a carrier for magnesium or a carrier for omega threes or a carrier for some some other type yeah. of product. So, because they yeah. are like crack, they just eat them. Yep. Yep. And that's. I think I think we're trying to figure out a more efficient system for doing that too. I mean, that adds labor to the system and everything else. Um, and there may be other ways to deal with that on, on dry feed, which would be a, maybe we need to have Dr. Petty on here at some point and, and talk through some of that. Uh, yes, he's on the list. So I, yeah. I already got him to tentatively agree. So. Uh, so with those single stomached animals, just to finish that, that thought process, that protein feeds directly to the animal. And so they can't take cellulose out of a grass plant and convert it into energy and essential fatty acids like a ruminant animal can. So we have to provide a direct protein source, um, an energy source to hogs or to chickens. Um, maybe that would be bugs or grubs or flies, but it also often is a, is a grain um, product that, that we have to supplement, even if they're on pasture. So the, the, do you know the ratio? So if, uh, if like sheep, can sustain themselves on six, seven percent protein. Do you know what is required for the single stomach? The protein requirement for just generally? I, I don't often. So like five times, four times, you know. The, it's higher, but I don't know the I don't know the exact ratio off the top of my head. That'd be a great question for uh, for Dr. Petty too. Um, yeah. I think it's both the quantity and the form of the protein. That, that yeah, everything is quality them. and form. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah same exactly. with soils. Same, exactly. Very same with soil. You have bound nitrogen and available nitrogen. And it's really important exactly. to know the difference. Exactly. Um, so then what are, um, 
what are some of the ways to manage these nutrients in the pastures? Uh, uh, what have you, and then in that, my kind of sub question is, can you focus too much on pasture versus too much on soil versus too much on the ant? Like if you had to choose one of the three, what should you focus on? And then what are some of the ways you manage that or available ways to manage my nutrients? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think I look at it maybe a little bit differently. I look at at the impacts that a grazing animal has in our pasture system. Um, you know, the primary impact that most of us think about is, is the consumption of that plant. So grazing is, is that primary impact in our pasture systems. Grazing impacts the plant, but it also impacts the soil because when we prune the top of the plant, we also prune the roots as we draw energy reserves out of those roots to get the plant to regrow. So that can change the dynamics in terms of the soil system to some extent. What, what would you say is another impact of animals on a pasture, just in terms of your observation? What else do they do besides eat a plant? Oh, well, they drop a little nitrogen on it, but it's yeah. usually, for me, it's not enough to be measurable. It's no. input, but it's not enormous. No, and I think that's a really a really good point point to make, Ryan. I think um, when we look at nitrogen flows in a pasture system, irrigated pasture is typically a nitrogen sink. We're pulling more nitrogen out of that pasture than we're adding to it by manure deposition or urine deposition, because some of that nitrogen that's pulled out and the, that the animals are grazing um, goes to make fiber or muscle or bone. I mean, it, it, it's removed when the animals go off the pasture. But one of the things that we can do with managing that manure deposition is where and how it gets spread, right? So if we're, partly if we're, if we're pulling some nutrients that are stored deep in the soil out of the roots, we can take those nutrients and put them on the soil surface where they're more available for future plant growth. So that's, that's one of the issues that we can think about. On a rangeland setting, if you know, if you're thinking about where sheep bed down, we're taking nutrients from all over that rangeland and concentrating them on the bed grounds. That's where and all so the stickers we, grow. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> what happens when we have excessive nutrients in our soils? Yeah. We grow foxtail and thistle, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, we can think about how we manage that nutrient deposition. The other thing, and I, I love this terminology, only a scientist would come up with this, but there is something called the um, zone of repugnance. Hmm. And if you look at a cow pie or a sheep manure pat in your pasture um, that maybe was deposited a month ago, you might notice that the animals haven't grazed the plants right around it for a little bit. And that's kind of an evolutionary response to, to that parasite issue or disease transmission. Um, they don't want to graze right around where they've defecated. And, and so um, that can impact our ability to, to graze a pasture. It takes up, takes up feed resources. What's the last thing that animals will also impact a pasture? By what, what other thing do you notice if they've been in? So on your seven day graze, by day six, what do you notice? Maybe. Oh, they start walking? They start walking and they trample the forage, right? Yeah. So stuff that they've trampled down, they maybe not are gonna graze as effectively as, as stuff that's standing up. But I look at, we can manage all three of those impacts to our benefit if we're paying attention to them. Certainly we want them to graze the plants because that's what's gonna put weight on or help them lactate. But let's say we've, uh, this is something we've done in our, our range ground. Say we've got a whole bunch of, of old rank Medusa head and star thistle that doesn't have any value to us at all. We're not gonna get to graze it much, but if we can get it in contact with the soil, those soil microbes are gonna break it down and, and turn it into soil organic matter. So we'll run sheep or cows back and forth across those old dead star thistle plants just to get them trampled into the ground a little bit and start cycling those nutrients back in. 
Um, and so I, I think kind of understanding those impacts and then looking at that bigger system, the plants, the soil, and the animal, and how they all relate to one another is, is at least for us, something that we try to do. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was really good. Um, what uh, what are some of the resources out there for somebody that doesn't know where to go that they want to take that next step and dig into what they got and figure out their pastures? What are, what are some of the stuff available to them? You know, every just about every county in, in California and, and other places, too, has a local natural resources conservation service office. Um, used to be called the Soil Conservation Service. And um, those folks are, are experts in terms of soil health and, and kind of those soil water plant relationships. Um, I, they'll come out free of charge and, and help you look at your soil quality and, and your irrigation systems and those types of things. Um, Cooperative Extension is another great resource. Just about every county has a livestock and or range advisor um, that, that can come out and help answer some of these questions specific to your operation. Um, I think there's some other resources out there that I find really valuable. Um, there was a, a guy who taught at Utah State who really looked at grazing behavior and plant responses um, named Fred Provenza. And um, if you look up um, grazing behavior and Fred Provenza, you'll get to his website. He wrote a, a great book. And I, I'm wondering if you've seen this called uh, The Art and Science of Shepherding. And he went and spent some time with um, one of his colleagues in France, just following French sheep herders around. And they had been grazing sheep in those in those areas for so long that these guys would actually plan what time of day their particular sheep needed to be in a specific area to graze the plants they needed to stimulate appetite later in the week or later in the month. And I mean, it was just, it's mind boggling the level of detail that, that these guys, some of whom probably were illiterate, had about the plants and the animal relationship with their animals and their system. So I think looking for those kinds of resources um, for me have helped me kind of look at, at our pastures differently. I, I try to pay more attention to what the animals are grazing or, or maybe what they're not grazing and, and how that changes from day to day or season to season or, or even year to year. Um, but I, I'd start with cooperative extension and, and with uh, NRCS in terms of those technical assistance pieces. So I guess my last question to kind of wrap this up is um, it, it would be it kind of, it's kind of a multi-layered question. We've touched on a lot of it already, but what, what would you, how do you de decide whether something's good sheep feed versus <laughs> bad sheep feed and then using grazing behavior to kind of utilize some of those maybe perceived bad feeds to your benefit? And I'm going to, I've, I'm curious as to your answer to this too. Um, kind of the flip answer that I would give is that there's no bad feed, there's just bad management. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there's certainly times of year when sheep aren't going to eat certain things. Um, I like a diversity in our pastures. Um, so I like a, a combination of grass and broadleaf, particularly clovers, but, but I think there's some value in some of the other broadleaf species that we have on our rangeland too. Um, our sheep, certain times of year, absolutely love mustard. Um, they like grazing chicory when we've got it in our irrigated pastures. Um, plantain is another plant that our sheep will actually seek out certain times of year. And I, part of it for me is kind of, trusting their nutritional wisdom. If we've got a diversity in, of plants in our system, trusting the sheep to find what they need at that particular life stage that they're in, whether it's lactation or, or um, maintenance or, or what have you. I had an opportunity um, last summer to spend some time 
up in the Sierra um, with a sheep outfit that grazes north of Truckee. And most of my experience with, with Sierra meadow grazing had been with cattle and, and I kind of know what, what the cows will eat. But talking to these sheep herders, um, even in my very poor Spanish, it was really, really interesting to talk to them about what they saw as, as good sheep feed. And as you've observed down there, it's a very different thing than what you would expect cattle to eat. You know, the sheep were going through and eating brush and eating some of the broadleaf plants that the cattle wouldn't know what to do with. And so because these guys had been grazing sheep up there in some one case for 20 years, he had a really good idea of where he needed to take the sheep in that landscape to meet their dietary needs. I think part of it is just a lifetime of experience and watching to, to determine what is good and, and what maybe is not so good and, and how you cope with that. How do you make that decision? What, what do you see as good sheep feed versus less good? I'll, I'll answer that after you answer this next. I got a <laughs> question. For you. So uh, is all sheep feed that they like to eat necessarily good? Because I've seen some cattle that really like oleander that don't make it. No, I think that's a good point. I think it's important to know what's, um, what's in your system that could be toxic too. With the exception of a few things like oleander, um, water hemlock, some of the really, really toxic plants, what we have found particularly in our system is that even when we do have some toxic plants, the sheep um, either buffer it by grazing things that aren't toxic as well, or they, they have an immediate feedback where they eat something that does cause some slight upset. Um, so to give an example in our irrigated pasture, one of our landlords is uh, big into monarch habitat and pollinators. And so she um, really likes the fact that she has narrow leaf milkweed growing on our irrigated pastures because that attracts the monarch butterflies. Well, if you read the book, narrow leaf milkweed has the same toxin as oleander. Um, and our sheep ignore it primarily, I think, because they may take a nibble of it, get kind of a stomach upset and decide that's not something they want to eat. I think our animals kind of do that too, with the exception of those things that they may get inadvertently in hay or, or you know, somebody's chipping oleander alongside a pasture and blowing the leaves into the pasture. They get a couple of bites of those leaves and that can be deadly. But um, good, good question. So, How do you look at, at good versus? versus <laughs> Yeah, so for us, we, we really, because we're all under fence and because it's all the, the way the pastures are set up, there's not a lot of, um, I don't know what you would call it, kind of like the, the mountain example where it's just, there's a lot of different choices, but we, yeah. we get to choose what we have. Um, and so as far as good sheep feed and bad sheep feed, it really gets back to those, you know, the diversity, the, the more diverse a pasture is, the better it's going to be for them. And yep. we do rotationally graze, even on our dry ground, our native ground, we rotate them, or we rotate them heavy in the spring, and then we stretch the rotation out in the winter or in the summer. And um, even in that, we end up utilizing the majority of the feed, of the plant base in the fields um, through that system. So everything pretty much gets used um, with the exception of, say, a Medusa or something like that, which pretty much has no nutritional value. And, um, but even then, you can feed, if you supplement with alfalfa or something like that, they will pick up that fiber to mix with it yep. and fill their yep. so it's and not that, a, I, Just a note on Medusa head, some of our, our winter ground has Medusa head on it. And adding protein gives us a way to fill their stomachs at a time of year when maybe there's not much else growing. Um, so it, it's not what I want to see, but it's not the end of the world either if we manage it appropriately and manage their nutrition appropriately. Yeah. Well, super. Well, thank you for this, uh, this great lesson. This is like a $25,000 education <laughs> in about 45 minutes. I'm pretty, uh, that was great. All right. Well, until next week, I guess this is Sheep Stuff You Should Know with uh, Ryan Mahoney and uh, 
Dan Macon, and, and we'll see you next week. Yes, sir. Take care, Dan. Thanks, Ryan.